Hi folks, I'm Ignacy Vishnevetsky. And I'm Alex Dabb. We are back again this week at Farmhouse Tavern, just around the corner from the AV Club office. Welcome to Film Club. All right, so Steve Jobs, a new film by Danny Boyle uh, and written by Aaron Sorkin, is about Apple founder Steve Jobs. It really plays more like a sort of greatest hits of Aaron Sorkinisms. You know, you have this sort of relentless walk and talk. There are a series of flashbacks that are illuminating the topics they're discussing. It's also characters explaining important points through anecdotes, which is another Sorkin favorite. It does have a really theatrical structure, right? I mean, it feels like a stage play, and it's broken up into three acts with pretty clear act breaks. Each one takes place backstage at a product launch. You have 84 with the launch of the Macintosh. You have 88 with the unveiling of Next, which is the company that Jobs founded after he got ousted from Apple. And then the final act takes place in 98 with the launch of the iMac. And you have kind of Steve Jobs going around these dressing rooms and backstage areas and running into the same people over and over and over same again. Same four people, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And each one kind of has their very clear purpose, right? You've got Jeff Daniels as John Scully, who represents father figures and for some reason is always asking Jobs about his family and about his adoption. Very Which are awkward rude questions. <laughs> really weird questions. I think the, like, the third thing he asks him about in the film is about. <laughs> How he feels about, about being, being adopted, adopted before they're, they're about to question. go on stage. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So then you have Kate Winslet as Joanna Hoffman, and she sort of represents his repressed paternal instinct and in his relationship with his daughter. Running into Seth Rogen, who plays Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple, and he's sort of the conscience of the film. And also, well, he represents Jobs' connection to this geek subculture that computing came out of. I think the actors do a pretty good job of breathing life into them as, I mean, I think that they're conceived pretty schematically, but I think the actors turn them into characters. I think the, the make or break for Steve Jobs is whether or not you have affection for those devices. Because I think that this is, in many ways, this is Sorkin sort of firing on all cylinders. Now, I, I was kind of into it in the early going, but I think the first time it transitions from one act to the next, I think it just, it fell apart for me. Like, I would have much rather it had just been a blackout, you know, that it was mm -hmm. totally theatrical. But instead you get these montages of all the things that happened in between, mm -hmm. and to me that just makes the theatrical structure feel like a gimmick. It's just context. It's allowing Boyle to be Boyle for a few minutes there. And I'll admit that he's not the perfect choice for this material. But I'll say this, uh, for, I mean, he makes a lot of missteps that, that, uh, that David Fincher would never make, for example. Yeah. Um, but I would say that directing Aaron Sorkin's dialogue, it, it does not direct itself. And a lot, I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty wonderful cast, and I think that they're all very good at, uh, at delivering these, um, these really, these sort of rat attack conversations. Yeah, but I mean, are you impressed by them at, on the level of performance or character, or are you impressed by this cast for being able to deliver this dialogue. Probably the latter. <laughs> but I mean, when you're dealing with something that's essentially an exercise in sort of walk and talk theater, the actors being able to keep up with that is important. Because Sorkin is good at writing exactly one thing. He's really good at writing monsters. The better parts of this film are the ones where uh, Fossbender playing Steve Jobs is just sort of allowed to be a monster yep. to all of these other people. That's highly entertaining, though. It's the portrait of, of the genius as total asshole, you know, which is what, which is what he did with The Social Network as yeah. well. Um, and The Social Network is a better film, I think, in part because they find a stronger dramatic core and also because Fincher is a much more accomplished <laughs> filmmaker than Danny Boyle is. Yeah, well, yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> because it's directed by Fincher. And the thing with Fincher is that his hand is strong enough that anything that he directs just becomes a David Fincher movie. It's a control of rhythm and of style, and I don't really see much of either going on here. All right, so you didn't like Steve Jobs. No. <laughs> you did like Crimson Peak, though. Yes. I think one reason uh, that maybe you prefer this, uh, one of maybe many reasons, uh, is that it actually is really confident directorially. Well, I think a lot of Guillermo del Toro's later films, they feel like sketchbooks. <laughs> you know, collections of uh, set designs, costumes, creature designs, mm -hmm. with kind of the thinnest skin of a movie yeah. over them. You've got this very simple Bluebeard story. Girl marries this sort of dissolute English aristocrat, leaves behind America. 
to come live with him and his sister in their very dilapidated, I mean, literally has a hole in the roof with snow falling into this mansion, it begins to catch on that there's something creepy going on, and also she can see ghosts. But as a directorial guided tour, I think it's, it's really something, because it does feel like Del Toro is leading you through this sort of, this world built out of his own obsession. If this is meant to function as a love story, yeah. I would say it mostly fails. No, it fails as a love story. The but love story is between Del Toro and this world. This is sort of just a vehicle for him to go wild with production design, mm -hmm. for him to go wild with creature effects. Um, I mean, the ghosts are familiar, but they're also really creepy and effective. It's just a film that never stops sort of amazing you with what it's showing you. Speaking of films that are gorgeous, this past week, The Assassin also opened in New York and LA, and it's expanding across the country right now. Yeah, the, the new Ho Shao Shen movie, mm -hmm. which is sort of his take on wuxia, the classic Chinese genre of martial arts and honor and unrequited romance. It's possible to tune out the story and still just revel in the imagery. Yeah, well, and here the story is pretty simple, right? Although very difficult to follow. Well, because it's <laughs> literally being, it's not that you yeah. you can tune out, it's being tuned out by the imagery. Yeah. Because you have this, this woman who's kidnapped as a child, is trained to be an assassin, and then is sent to kill the Lord to whom she was once betrothed. And that's basically it. Yeah, it's ravishingly gorgeous. I mean, it's saturated with color. In terms of production design, yeah, it's sort of neck and neck with Crimson Peak. I yeah. mean, this is a very, this is a very gorgeously realized world. The moment when they cut from black and white to color mm -hmm. is like cinema. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like this, this is what cinema can do. I feel like the imagery, as you could say, as in Crimson Peak, the imagery is the point. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that whereas Del Toro has this sort of production designer's sensibility of everything being cool, you know, come sort of check this out. That's his, mm -hmm. his approach. Ho definitely has the sensibility of a poet, which yes. I think is very different. His use of, of, of symbolism here and metaphor um, is so much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm.